This is Signal University's presentation of What is a Satellite? A communication satellite is one of the most important inventions of the later half of the 20th century. We're going to talk about what one is, why it does what it does, and we'll talk about how satellites can be used for television. The word satellite just means anything that's still connected to you, even though it's far away from you. There are two kinds of satellites in the sky. Natural satellites are things like the moon. We only have one of those on Earth. On the other hand, there are literally thousands of artificial satellites. They're used for spying, they're used for camera, they're used for Google Earth, and in the case of this particular presentation, they're used for television. Communication satellites orbit the Earth, something like this. What they really appear to do is sit above a fixed point in space. And the whole purpose of a satellite is to be like a walkie-talkie. Information goes up, it gets processed, and sent back down. If you're asking how a satellite stays in the sky, it's an excellent question. After all, most things don't just hover over a fixed point in space. There is some math to it, though, and it actually does work. Let's start with gravity. The further away you get from the center of the Earth, the less gravity affects you. So if you get something up high enough, it's not going to fall as fast. It still might fall very slowly, but it's not going to fall as fast. The next piece of the puzzle is centrifugal force. Centrifugal force is the tendency of something to fly away from you when it's spinning. Like put a bunch of quarters in a sock and spin them around. You'll see they want to fly away. That sort of thing. If you can get to the point where gravity is pulling down at the same level that centrifugal force is trying to spin away, then the object will appear not to move. This is a point where it can be what we call geostationary or happy. Geostationary orbit means that it looks from our point of view like something is hovering over exactly the same point on the Earth all the time. How's it done? It's kind of neat. If you have something that orbits the Earth in exactly one day and it's sitting exactly over the equator, it's going to seem like it's hovering over one point. How high up does it need to be? 22,000 miles is the magic number for gravity, centrifugal force, and geostationary orbit to all work out. This is a typical communication satellite. There are three major parts to it. Solar panels take energy from the sun and convert it into electricity to run all the electronics. Transponders take the transmissions from the Earth, reprocess them, and send them back down. And finally, Thrusters are basically big aerosol cans that help the satellite retain its position. Let's talk a little bit more about transponders. Transponder is a word that means transmitter and responder. In other words, there's a transmission from Earth. It gets processed. It gets thought about. And then, after that, it gets responded or sent back to Earth. This happens millions of times a second so fast that you don't even know about it. Backhaul is the term that's used for those transmissions that go up to the satellite. An average satellite only uses one quarter of its capacity to send information down to regular folks. One quarter is used for backhaul and the other half of it is used for spares. After all, you can't just drive up to a satellite and fix something. This is a typical satellite dish of the sort that you'd find on a home, office, or restaurant. It's oval because it has to point at more than one satellite at the same time. This kind of dish can't transmit. All it does is receive. Let's take a look at what it does. DirecTV uses three primary satellite locations. These hit the center of the dish. However, there are two other secondary satellite locations that this dish can also pick up. When all five of them are working, everything is pointed toward the center part of the dish, called the LNB, and everything works. A satellite dish is basically an amplified antenna, and so it needs power to do its job. Power for a satellite dish can come from one of three sources. Sometimes from the receiver itself, sometimes from a multi-switch, and sometimes from something called a polarity locker. One way or the other, however, that dish is going to need power to do its job. The front part of a dish is called an LNB. This is a typical LNB assembly. The white parts are called feed horns, and inside are the actual LNBs. An LNB is a combination of two things. It's a low noise amplifier, meaning that it takes information from the satellite 
and amplifies it greatly without adding a lot of noise. And it's a block down converter, meaning that it takes information from a very high frequency and puts it on a very low frequency, which makes a lot more sense for sending it down a cable. Most satellite broadcasting takes place on the KU band at 12,000 to 18,000 megahertz. Remember, radio and television is more like 400 to 800 megahertz. They use these high frequencies because that way they need a lot less power to get a lot more distance. Some satellites broadcast on the KA band, which is 26,500 to 40,000 megahertz. However, only DirecTV US uses the KA band. Pretty much everybody else is just using that KU band. Now remember how I said block down converter? All the stuff from those bands gets translated down and when it travels over the cable, it's traveling at a frequency of 250 to 2100 megahertz, which makes a lot more sense for putting electricity through a wire. All communication satellites sit up above the equator. They have to in order to have geostationary orbit. Direct TV satellites sit in a cluster at 101, 99, and 103 degrees. These are the ones that are used primarily for standard definition and high definition service. There's a fourth satellite that's used for some standard definition service at 119 degrees. There are also international satellites, and when I say international, I mean they still go to the US, but they carry non-English language programming. Among these are the 110 satellite that used to be used for English language programming, as well as two other satellites at 72 and 95 degrees. On the other hand, DISH uses two completely different sets of satellites, one for the East Coast and one for the West Coast. The Western Arc covers most of the United States with three satellite locations at 110, 119, and 129. The Eastern Arc, on the other hand, is over at 61.5, 72, and 77 degrees. Remember, these are locations. There can be more than one satellite at each location. Even though most people today use DirecTV or DISH to get their satellite service, some people still use this C-band DISH, also known as a free-to-air DISH or big ugly DISH. Why is it called a big ugly DISH? Well, because it's 10 feet wide. C-band dishes are used to get unencrypted satellite service, which means satellite service that you don't have to pay anybody for a decoder to use. Most DirecTV and DISH programming is broadcast all over the continental United States. We use the term CONUS, and it just means Continental United States. Let's take a look at this map. This is DirecTV's satellite coverage. Everything inside the yellow line is where you'd get relatively good service. Unfortunately, it goes pretty far into southern Canada, northern Mexico, and the Caribbean. It's very important to remember, however, it is illegal to send DirecTV or DISH equipment across the border. It's against Canadian law, U.S. law, and Mexican law, not to mention the laws of all the countries in the Caribbean. This is a spot beam. DirecTV and DISH use very tightly focused beams over very particular areas to provide local channels to different areas. That's why if you drive away from your local area too far in your RV, you're going to get all those national CONUS channels, but you won't get any of your locals. Unlike cable television, splitters cannot be used in most cases to split a satellite signal. There is one exception, and that's DirecTV's SWIM technology, which is specifically designed to allow you to use special splitters like the one you see here to split a signal off much more easily. The reason you can't use a splitter is because there can be up to six different kinds of signals coming out of a satellite dish at any given time. Four of them come from the regular dish, and the other two are for international programming only. So, if two different receivers needed two different signals, a regular splitter just isn't going to work. A multi-switch, on the other hand, has up to six inputs for the six different kinds of signals it gets. It has four, eight, sixteen, or thirty-two outputs that can each run a different receiver. And the neat part, as you can see from the simple animation, is that any output can get a signal from any input and not interfere with any of the receivers next to it. Satellite signals can be very weak. In fact, there's something like one ten thousandth of the power of an average nightlight by the time they get to your satellite dish. In order to compensate, 
Sometimes we will use amplifiers and polarity lockers to make sure that the signal is as strong as it can possibly be by the time it gets to the receiver. An amplifier for a satellite works just like an amplifier for voice or for anything else. It takes a little thin signal, little tiny quiet signal, and makes it into a really loud signal. However, it doesn't really change the signal. Whatever goes in goes out just louder. A polarity locker, on the other hand, is kind of neat. It takes all the different kinds of signals in, but it only puts out one kind of signal on the way out. This means that signal can be as strong as possible. A polarity locker also has a power supply that is used to power the dish so that it's less stress on the multi-switch or receiver. That's the end of this training. If you have any further questions, check out the Signal Group forums at solidsignal.com forum or send us an email, info at solidsignal.com.